Good evening and welcome to the New York Public Library. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brent Reedy. I am the interim Andrew W. Mellon Director of the Research Libraries here. Uh, whether you are in person or out there online, hello and welcome to Live from NYPL. I have the great fortune and honor of introducing two of our favorite people here at the library, Tim Gunn and Stacy Schiff. Both are library patrons and supporters and friends here. Tim is a regular guest at Live from NYPL. He is also the judge of our annual Halloween costume contest, <laughs> which returns in person this Friday for the first time in three years. Uh, it turns out that Tim is also, like me, a huge fan of Stacy Schiff and her writing. Stacy is a library lion, and more importantly, she has written and researched books in this very building, including the newest, the one we're here to talk about tonight, the revolutionary Samuel Adams. That book is available for purchase in the room. If you stick around after, Stacy is happy to sign a copy for you. All proceeds from the purchase go to benefit the library. And of course, if you have your New York Public Library card, which I am sure every person in this room does, uh, you can get one from one of our branches. So Stacy's new book is a prime example of the kind of research that is possible at the library. In this library, she could come to know Samuel Adams through his correspondence, his letters, letters written to him. She could better situate him in his time by looking through contemporary archives and other historical documents. She could paint a picture of his life through images in our print and picture collections. And of course, she, she could consult heaps of previously published scholarship, all of it available to the public for free. We steward on behalf of you all, our public, some 50 million objects of cultural, cultural heritage. Uh, the number is growing. We continue to collect on a daily basis. Countless stories are waiting to be discovered in our stacks. That is the role of these collections, not to lie passively in some kind of cold storage, but to ignite and to inspire. They are to serve as the resources for the storytellers and historians of today. Researchers like Stacy are what keep this institution so vibrant. Her new book paints an electric, enthralling portrait of Samuel Adams as potentially the most catalytic and influential founding father. I'm thrilled to learn more about this tonight and we'll learn much more in just a moment when Stacy and Tim join us on stage. Quickly, however, I'd like to tell you about a few other upcoming live from NYPL events. Tomorrow in this very room, Siddhartha Mukherjee will speak about his latest book, The Song of the Cell, with Andrew Solomon. And this Friday, like I mentioned, do not miss our annual Halloween costume contest uh, held across the street on the terrace of the beautifully renovated Starvos Niarchos Foundation Library. Uh, Tim Gunn is going to guest judge along with some of our librarians. Uh, believe me, there is not a more fun or entertaining night than wit witnessing the craft, the creativity, the ingenuity of New Yorkers uh, when they bring all of this to a literary-themed contest with no prize but bragging rights. <laughs> Next week, Bernstein Award winner Andrea Elliott and past Bernstein nominee finalist Beth Macy will talk about journalism, reporting American crises, and their incredible new books. And if that wasn't enough, four-time Hugo Award winner N.K. Jemison talks about her latest book with the one and only LeVar Burton. Believe it or not, there is more, and every event is free. Go to nypl.org slash live to register. But back to tonight. Uh, at the end of the conversation, we're going to save a few minutes. Uh, Stacy will be glad to answer some of your questions. Those of you here in person, you see the note cards and paper on your chair. At any point in the evening, please write down a question that you have. Our wonderful staff will be wandering to collect those periodically. If you are online, you can type your question to our chat or send us an email at publicprograms at nypl.org. Wherever you are, we would love to hear from you. Live from NYPL is made possible through the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos. And of course, by all of you, our public, our supporters. Thank you, thank you for your support. And with that, please join me in welcoming Stacy Schiff and Tim Gunn. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. How thrilling is this? We have Stacy Schiff in person. And Tim Gunn in person. <laughs> I just want to begin by saying that I thought that I knew a fair amount about Samuel Adams. A mere 10 pages into Stacy's book, I realized I know nothing. I knew only the, ba the bare periphery of everything that, that Adams achieved. And, and quite frankly, what he went through in his life, it was remarkable. Um, so I'm certain you're probably very much like me. And Stacy, I'd like to begin by asking you, what was the catalyst for writing the book? Well, just to go back a step, think how embarrassing that would be when you realized you knew nothing about Samuel Adams and you were born in Adams, Massachusetts. Right? I mean, so <laughs> Are you saying that about yourself? I am, unfortunately, yes. Um, so it was, I would say there were a certain a number of different avenues that led to the book. Um, one of them was precisely that, was the realization that we have on the record all of these 18th century testimonies from other founders about how crucial Samuel Adams was. Jefferson calls him the most, the earliest, the most active, the most persevering man of the revolution. Um, and yet we know, frankly, nothing about him. So what did they know that we don't know? And how did he go so much missing? Um, then there was um, this sense really that um, you couldn't really explain the revolution without him. He seemed, he seemed in so many ways to answer questions that in, endure, like how did the revolutionary, how did the resistance take off with the, in the, at the accelerated pace that it did? And I think the book opens with Paul Revere for the very reason that we all know that Paul Revere got on a horse in mid-April, 1775. We all think we know what color the horse was, but actually we don't. Um, but we don't know where Paul Revere was going, and where he was going was to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock of imminent arrest, if not outright assassination, as the papers had it. So the fact that I didn't know that was truly humbling, and I think those were, in large part, the genesis of the book. Well, and I didn't know it either. I mean, it, it, it was electrifying to learn all of this. I, I just think it's funny that you think we all, we all know where Paul Revere was riding, but no one thinks about where, yeah. where was he yeah. going? To whom? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. exactly. He no, was meant to have a destination of some kind. Very, very true. Right. Um, can you tell us about Samuel Adams' early years and, and his foundation? I was fascinated to learn that he was one of 12 children, only three of whom lived past the age of three. So it says a lot about the context of that time and about infant mortality. The 18th century um, birth statistics are, are very sobering, indeed. Yes. Um, he grows up in a very wealthy family and proceeds over the course of his early 20s and 30s to essentially squander a fortune and run a business into the ground, um, which I, for some reason, find very endearing. <laughs> that he starts his life off as a perfect failure and really doesn't amount to anything until his early 40s. I'm not going to touch why I find that so endearing. Um, but but he, the fact that he grows up in a home as a well-off young man, he, he's at a young age, at, at 14, he's sent off to Harvard. He goes to the right schools. He, get a master, he gets a master's at Harvard. Um, and then, then proceeds to squander the family fortune. Um, the fact that he's downwardly mobile is something that is lost on the crown officers who come to dislike him so much. They think of him, they will come to think of him as a very disappointed man, as some kind of desperado who's doing what he's doing because he's poor. But they never take into account the fact that he'd actually grown up in an affluent home, and, which I think is a very different calculus, in fact. Um, but, the short answer to your question is he grows up with a great deal of potential. Um, the family is actually ruined by an act of parliament, which may have something to do with what happens later. Um, and he pretty much just kind of ambles around um, for the first couple of decades until he finds his groove, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, and begins to um, write papers um, for members of the House of Representatives. And that's really where the career takes off. He's done a bit of newspapering before that, and is clearly much admired for his style. Yes, and intensely interested in politics. I think he lives for politics. I mean, we all know people like this. He does at one point um, get a job in an accounting firm and um, clearly has his head in the clouds, can only think about the political scene, and the owner of the firm, who's actually a family friend and a very popular man in Boston, um, basically says, you know, he's a very able young man, but he can't think of anything but politics and fires him. Yes. So, yeah, one obsession and, and really nothing else 
across the radar. And a, a, a true Puritan. Very much wed to his faith, very much wed to the deep Calvinist values, simplicity, education, the idea of a church without a leader and a state without a king. Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say that that pretty much permeates um, the writing from an early age. Can you talk to us about the percolation of the revolution and how it was beginning to go from ether into something that's coagulated and really concrete and meaningful? I think the, the probably the, the best way to condense it is to say that with the new with new efforts at legislation with the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act, um, Great Britain is attempting to sort of rework the relationship between colonies and mother country. And is so far divorced from American psychology that it doesn't, or for that matter, of the American continent, that it doesn't really see what the effects of those legislation, what those, those acts are going to be. Immediately the colonists feel, not just in Massachusetts, but elsewhere, that something like a Stamp Act um, is really a disenfranchising act, that somehow this means that we are no longer in charge of our own destinies, someone else across the ocean is, and this is an onerous piece of legislation which must be resisted at all costs. And that we have absolutely no say in. Precisely. And, and that is a feeling, it's the first time that the colonies really are all on the same page. Um, and and, and those, are the, those are the beginnings of, I would say, the political awakening both in the colonies and as well for Samuel Adams, who, is, who leads the effort to write responses to those pieces of legislation. Very thoughtfully and very passionately. And, and that is pretty much where things begin to take off. What's really interesting when you, when you, look, at the, when you look at the record is how little Great Britain understands of these colonies, which presumably have brought them wealth and power over the years. Um, no one's really entirely sure where North America is. Um, people constantly refer to things like, you know, those islands, Boston and Philadelphia, which are maybe in the East Indies or maybe in the West Indies. I mean, there's a lot of cloudiness here, both about the relationship and about what, what, Americans, what Americans really are. And, and that does account for some of the missteps. Well, and I have to say, from what I digested from your book, I gathered that they didn't care. I, I guess the word arrogance should probably come into the conversation at this moment. <laughs> There's a certain smugness about those, those colonists off in their rudimentary land, you know, which is America. And I, of course, had heard about the, uh, the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act. Until reading your biography, they weren't, they weren't fleshed out to me. I didn't realize all the permutations and the subtleties and nuances. I think that we, because we're, I think we're taught them at an age where they just seem sort of like it's one, it's like history, one thing after yeah. another, um, as they say in the History Boys. I think we forget that each of these pieces of legislation was really an attempt to kind of just situate the colonies, and, to, to rework the relationship with the colonies. And, and really, of those acts, the most crucial is the Declaratory Act, which is after, when the Stamp Act is repealed, the Declaratory Act is, is put on, is brought into effect essentially to make certain that the colonies understand that Parliament now has the power to legislate yes. for them in any situation whatsoever. And that is a much more onerous act, in fact, than any of the others had been. But everyone is so relieved that the Stamp Act has been repealed that no one really pays attention or wants to pay attention to this. It's sort of like, you know, why ruin the party? Except, of course, for Samuel Adams, who sees this kind of slumbering threat in the, declar in the Declaratory Act. And he was quite right. And he also believed that, um, to steal your own words, that... Oh, steal away. By <laughs> <laughs> but that to, to, to give even a modicum of compromise to any of these issues meant that we were setting a precedent that British Parliament could just step in and walk all over. So these acts were really a means for British Parliament to earn revenue for Britain at the metaphorical raping and pillaging of the people in, who were here. Even, even the Crown officers will um, say of these acts that it's like killing the golden goose, that there's this sense that the colonies are somehow reaping these huge profits. Um, they're very expensive to administer, so why don't we adjust the math a little bit so that we get some of the money from administering these colonies? Surely they won't notice. And, and in fact, many of these acts lower the prices on things. Yes. So the, the, well, the idea there was, you know, just accept this little duty, but we'll bring the price down. Well, the Tea Party was Correct. an example of that, Correct. which I learned. I had no idea. Um, 
how do you place atoms within the context of these various uprisings? Was he, um, was he at the core of it? Was he on the, the, the peripheral? I have so many questions for this man. I wish he would come back <laughs> and answer them. Um, it, it's, he, it's very clear that much of this is done by committee. Massachusetts worked by committee. Um, if, you needed, if you needed to solve a committee problem, you appointed another committee. I mean, it was committee piled on committee. Um, so between the fact that much is done by committee and the fact that Adams works largely in back rooms, it can be very hard to find him in certain places. So what one ends up doing, and this is actually very much like Cleopatra, is reading what his enemies had to say about him. And when you read what the crown officers who find him to be their nemesis say about him, he's in the forefront, he's in the vanguard. It's he who is the one inexorable person. He's the one person who will never be satisfied. He's the one person who will not relent in terms of publishing yeah. all kinds of seditious sounding things. We see him a little more clearly at times like the Boston Tea Party. Um, there are a lot of clues. A few weeks before the tea arrives, um, he writes to his chief correspondent in London and says, uh, you know, if, unless someone on your side of the ocean finds a solution, I will have a non-trifling matter to report to you soon. It sounds like a pretty heavy-handed hint. Um, and after the Tea Party, um, Thomas Hutchinson, the governor, will say that Adams was never in greater glory. I mean, it's very clear that he's at the center of that event. If he didn't orchestrate it, he certainly helped to orchestrate it. Um, when witnesses are later deposed in London, people who had witnessed the tea being thrown overboard, they'll all cite Adams at the top of the list of perpetrators or of organizers. Um, he's very conspicuously not at the wharf that night, which is yes. another indication that he's very central to the event. So it, it sometimes can be hard to find him. Um, every once in a while, thanks mostly to John Adams, who kept such incredibly good track of things and, and wrote volumes. Um, we can see him very clearly at a room at the printing office of the Boston Gazette, for example. Sunday night, Samuel Adams was there helping to set type, making sure that his, his, his words got into the paper. So there are times where we can see him very clearly. Very often, he's behind the scenes. And John Adams, by the way, was the second cousin of Samuel Adams. So Stacy, you spent a, a good deal of time here at the library. Oh, I spent decades here. <laughs> <laughs> Researching Adam's papers. What did they reveal to you? Well, the beauty of the collection upstairs, um, which I'm so immensely fond of, is that it has both sides of the correspondence. So Samuel Adams's letters, for the most part, although not entirely, have been published, but we don't have the other side. Ah. So it's when you begin to read what he's responding to and whom he's corresponding with that you get, obviously, a fuller sense of the man. Um, and what you find is this. In him, despite his image as a sharp-elbowed, brawling firebrand, um, he's an immensely sophisticated and affable and charismatic um, individual, which also which John Adams also makes clear. John Adams makes clear that he's extremely genteel. He says he's of an exquisite humanity, um, clearly very charming, entertains in lovely style, and just a very sort of pious, easygoing, affable man, which is not at all the image I think that most of us have it's if we know anything about Samuel Adams, um, other than the fact that he's on a beer. Um, <laughs> so, so I think that comes through very strongly in much of the correspondence. He's a constant and, and voluminous writer. And that is true really in terms of what he, what he publishes in the press. It's also true in the correspondence. There are also big holes in the correspondence. We have very little of his personal um, letters to his family. Oh. And only because I'm here in the New York Public Library, I think I should mention the Holy Grail in case anyone has it under his bed. Um, there's a memoir, there was a memoir of Samuel Adams somewhere between 40 and 50 pages of one, written by his daughter, which when I began the project, I assumed was here in the library, and which has never turned up. Oh. So if anyone has it, really, <laughs> this would be the moment. You never know. I know, I just feel like I should ask everyone I know. It's such a heartbreak, <laughs> because the, that, that personal piece is really missing with him. We have very devoted letters to his wife from the Continental Congress. Um, he always asks about the family. He's clearly very close with his daughter. There are a few conversations with the daughter, but we just don't have the personal dimension. How did you learn the memoir? 
it's mentioned in his great grandson's account of the life. Oh, the great grandson. In a footnote, yes. which I shared with every librarian on the East Coast. Oh, yeah. that's. <laughs> I also. I, I want to address, through you, of course, um, Adam's unfettered tenacity. I mean, when you consider the obstacles that were thrown in his path and the tremendous resistance that he faced and the criticisms, it would have been so easy just to have said, I'm out, you people take care of this. What do you think was responsible for, for that tenacity? I think you see it particularly after the Boston Massacre, between 1770, in 1773, things go very quiet. And I think that's, to me, by the way, one of the interesting things about the life is that it reveals to us how nonlinear um, the revolutionary effort was. I mean, it goes in fits and starts, it's very rough and tumble, and it, it stalls at various points. And between 1770 and 1773, Adams is really the only person, most, much of the time, who is still nattering on about infringed rights and, and about American liberties. Um, I think that's the character to a large extent. I mean, I think there is a pugnacious side to him, and that is part of it, but I also feel like he's just deeply idealistic and courageous, and, and you know, in a sort of noble way. This is the one thing that really matters to him. He realizes that everyone else has gone quiet, but the situation hasn't changed, and he pretty much is banking on the fact that something will come along and re reinvigorate the cause, as in fact it does. Um, because you can always count on British missteps. That was one yes. thing that was certain. Um, so I think there is just a sense of knowing that he's going to get there. It's an interesting thing because he's a man who doesn't make plans. And yet on this one issue, he seems utterly intent on where he's going. I was struck by that. Struck, especially during the quiet time when everyone else is saying, okay, the Boston Massacre happened. Now we can just not relax, but just yeah. enjoy a little bit of peace. And for Adams, no, it's let's move forward, let's continue. There's a great letter of Thomas Hutchinson, the, the, the governor at that point, I think he's acting governor at that point, um, where he basically says, you know, everyone's gone quiet, I've bought off this person, I bribed that person, um, you know, I've got even John Adams is quiet, it's just this one guy whom I can't seem to bribe. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, bribes were the time-honored method of keeping people quiet, and this just this one person couldn't be, couldn't be satisfied. So can you take us to 1775 when the revolution is actually happening? Um, and I, I was not extensively reading, but, but looking at some other biographies. Of, Wait, there of, are other biographies? <laughs> <laughs> some other biographies of Adams. Um, and people were saying that he really didn't have a revolutionary bone in his body until the, the revolution started to percolate. But your book certainly says otherwise. You know, one of the things we can't answer and I'm not sure we can answer this for every founder, we certainly can't answer it for Adams, is at what moment um, resistance begins to melt into revolution? When yeah. does he believe in independence? And I think traditionally his biographers, because I do know there have been previous ones, um, have said 1768, when British troops first march into Boston, uh -huh. that is the moment that on which Sam, it makes many other people think we've now crossed a Rubicon, but it's unclear if Adams it really does sort of see independence coming at that point. The one moment where he finally mentions it is he believes independence should have been declared the morning after Lexington and Concord. Mm -hmm. And then he's, you know, then, then blood has been shed. It's absolutely certain that this is our future. You know, he, he can't understand why everyone in Philadelphia is taking so long. And, and he does become very much the a bane of the existence of any mild-mannered moderate in Philadelphia. He really is driving straight toward independence at that point. But it's unclear in those other years, is he thinking, you know, what does he think the solution is to this? It's clearly he's not interested in any kind of um, backsliding. Right. Does he really see independence? Nothing. And obviously there's nothing on paper because when you're fomenting rebellion, you no. don't really want your fingerprints showing. <laughs> So, and, and that's, that too, I should have mentioned, is that was one of the hardest scenes to write. John Adams tells us of being in Philadelphia um, at the Continental Congress with, that, with his cousin Samuel, and Samuel is feeding his papers to the fire um, so that none of his allies will be, none of his friends will be compromised. And on another occasion, John says he's, he's cutting them into shreds and littering them from the window. So there was the, there's my record right there. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a great deal we don't know about what was happening behind the scenes. 
and we don't ever have a moment where he seems to say, here's where I, you know, turned and looked to the future. What's interesting too, at least for me personally, well, I guess personally is, is the right term to use. Um, so much of Adam's actions and behavior parallels what's happening today in this nation and in other places, but in Adam's case, it's all for the right reasons. He's shredding documents for the right reasons. He's throwing things <laughs> into the fire for the right reasons. He's and, publishing for the right reasons, and yes. For the right reasons and yes. honorable reasons. Yes. I hadn't thought about the keeping documents at home part of this story. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, the modern resonances are really kind of sobering in many ways. I mean, even the, the, the overlap of the media. I mean, Adams organizes these things called committees of correspondence, which sounds utterly dreary, but they weren't dreary, um, it, because he thinks that if every town in the colony of Massachusetts and then ultimately along the, all of the colonies can correspond with each other, obviously unanimity will reign. And his idea is to essentially wire the colonies for rebellion, in fact. Um, after the Boston Tea Party, the responses from those committees to Boston, you know, on what Boston has just done with the tea, it's literally, it sounds like Twitter today. Everybody's saying the same thing, kind of retweeting each other um, in their responses. And there's just this extraordinary, you know, swelling of admiration for Boston. There are occasionally some, you know, reluctant notes of admiration. But for the most part, there's this upsurge of enthusiasm for Boston coming from all over the place. And so this idea that you could actually kind of, you know, hardwire everyone into the same you know, mentality really takes off. And I have to say too, reflecting upon today, when it's so easy to spread the word, how is all that facilitated so well? Well, I guess the cheap answer to your question is what Adams does during the occupation between 1768 and 1770, which is um, soldiers are now in, in Boston, much to everyone's dismay. And Adams and a, and a few of his friends, we don't know how many, found a, a sort of newspaper syndicate, for lack of a better term, where they write up these um, very lurid, sensationalistic accounts of encounters between townspeople in Boston and the troops. And then they don't print them in Boston. They send them to New York, and then they send them to Philadelphia. And then, after they've appeared in those papers, then finally, weeks later, they're printed in Boston, by which time nobody knows if it actually really happened. So it's this brilliant way of propagating the news, all of it, much of it fake news, in fact, um, and the riling up the, I mean, inflaming the town of Boston because these accounts are all of, you know, women who were assaulted and old yep. women who were, you know, who were robbed and soldiers brandishing their weapons in men's faces. And as poor beleaguered Thomas Hutchinson will say, you know, after all these fictive acts of violence, it would be very surprising if there weren't a factual one. And then, of course, we get the Boston Massacre. Yes, we do. So, we do. But, it, but in fact, this very much sets the temper of the town. Would you portray Adams as, as a propagandist? Yes, I would say he was a master propagandist. Absolutely. I mean, much of this material was definitely, let's just put it this way, account, no accounts of those misdeeds appears in the legal record. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. What surprised you most in your research? I think to a large extent how crucial he is. I mean, I do yeah. not think you can explain the revolution without fitting him back into the picture. After reading your book, I totally agree. Thank you can't. You. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I, I, mean, I, think, I think I was surprised in a funny way by how central um, he ends up being. Um, he's immensely eloquent. I mean, there's rousing anthem after rousing anthem. I mean, it's very hard to read it and not read his material and not be moved by it, oh, I think. Oh, I, I was moved to tears. Um, I love that. So, yeah. And also, it's just a, it's such an odd life. I mean, it's such a, you have these, you know, first 40 years of um, aimlessness, and then you have these electrifying 12 years, and then you have a very unsatisfying third act. And that's yes. just such a strange, that's such a strange arc to a life. But, but I think the, the answer to your question really is the nobility and the tenacity of the character. I mean, he's very, he's, it's really sterling patriotism, old it's style patriotism. Sterling. Well, I, I told you earlier, you have, for me, healed my own wounds over the whole term of patriotism. Because today we look, we, we hear the word and we think, oh my God, we're talking about, well, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, and he, I, I mean, to be honest, your book made me, regain a pride 
in being a citizen of this nation. That's lovely. That's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Would you mind talking? You're making me feel so much better about freezing in that room upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind talking about Adam's third act? Oh, not at all. It's just so depressing, isn't it? I know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. a, it's a funny. It's a funny. You know problem for the biographer. He's, he lives for a very long time. He lives to his 80s. Um, yeah, but, yeah, he, he, spends an, he spends an inordinate amount of time in Congress, and Congress, as you can imagine, is a, was a slow moving then as it is today. So he, he's very frustrated by the years in Congress, and he is very far from Massachusetts. Yeah. And in those days, to be in Philadelphia was really far from Massachusetts. So he's kind of lost touch with his own, with, with Boston and with his own sort of, with the mentality of New England. He spends, so he spends these years in Philadelphia, and by the time he gets back, he's a little bit a man out of place. Um, he's out of, out of, sort of just out of sync with Boston. He's out of sync with the America that he's helped to found. Um, he's very much a man of the old world. He believes still in purity and simplicity and probity, and America is rushing forward toward wealth and opulence, which is not where he expected the, the new nation to no, be headed at all. So he's kind of you know, got his heels stuck in the ground. Um, he's at odds, we can talk about this if you want, he and John Hancock fall out. And John yes. Hancock, who's very popular in Boston, largely because he's been extremely generous with Boston, um, is a man of great ostentation and who has come to hate Samuel Adams. So by the time they come, both of them come back from Congress, Hancock does everything he can to destroy Adams's reputation. So those last, those last couple of decades, he can't really get a purchase on things. He's pretty much a man out of time. Hancock is inaugurated governor you know, time after time after time. Adams is becoming more of a relic with each inauguration. Um, and he's sort of the first, he's kind of the first port of call. If you were an aspiring revolutionary from another country and you came to America, you called on you know, Samuel Adams because he was you know, known to be, have been first among patriots. Um, but otherwise, he's really just sort of increasingly forgotten. He's very briefly governor of Massachusetts. Um, another historian makes the exceptionally good point that the higher he rises in the hierarchy, the worse he, 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 the worse he is at the job. So he really doesn't do terribly well as governor. And he dies at 81. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting about the rise and then his, the fact that he's less effective. Do you think part of that was psychological for him? I think he's probably very old at that point. Okay. I mean, it's very hard to get a sense, obviously, medically, of what's going on, but he sounds to have been verging on debility of some kind at that point. Yeah. It was just a, it was a very sad ending, and I, I have to say, everyone, the, the end of Stacy's book was uplifting, but simultaneously tremendously sad. It's hard because you still have people like Jefferson. Jefferson yeah. saying, saying, writing to Adams and saying, you know, my, my inaugural address, my second inaugural was a letter to you because I still think of you as the ultimate Republican. I still think of you as the embody, the perfect embodiment of what this country stands for and what we fought for. And nothing in Adams's existence at that point would betray that kind of confidence. It's very, very true, yeah. Very, very true. I mean, he, he was um, unwavering. In, in his convictions, and that's so admirable. But as you say, America was changing and evolving, and he had his feet dug in. He has, this, he has this one great line at the end where he says, you know, no one ever called me inexorable, and I'm thinking, everybody called you inexorable. <laughs> <laughs> You're really gonna try to say that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you think that was a lack of self-awareness? I think, I think none of us sees what our biographer sees, thank oh. goodness, <laughs> yes. Speaking of, I am confident that your bi biography will be the biography of Samuel Adams. There's a lot of mythology in many of the other biographies, and, and you cut through so much of that by going to the original sources. There's a, there's a lot. You know, what, what was really helpful with, with this book was not only the papers upstairs, but are the British archives. Because when you begin to see um, what is being written about um, Adams from the point of view of the Crown officers. I mean, he's, the, he's making these guys crazy. And he's really, I mean, as I say in the book, he's like a cartoon character just running circles yeah. around them. And he outmaneuvers them. I mean, he could create a loophole and dive through it before they could finish a sentence. And the ability on his part to, you know, start a boycott, start a picket, create an extra legal institution, all of these acts which we today would consider, you know, civil resistance theory, he had down to a science, and he somehow just instinctively seems to figure out a way to do it, against all odds and often very much on his own. 
So those documents, those screeches of for, uh, the screeds against Samuel Adams, which are in the British papers, were hugely helpful as well in terms of fleshing out the story. I can imagine. There also are, the, are those who have said, he wasn't really a revolutionary, he was a reformer. How do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I think um, the, given what he's doing to undermine the administration, it would be very hard not to call him a revolutionary. I would agree. But I think there you touch on the question of when does he come around to, to the idea of independence? And, you know, again, we're, we're sort of in the dark on that one. Though you make it clearer than I think anyone else has um, in terms of, of what the whole trajectory was. I mean, I think the, the, the rough and tumble in the streets kind of demonstrations, um, those were not, those, those had a distinct aim. They were not simply done for the sake of upsetting the apple cart. Right, those it wasn't just to, a riot. To a very logical it had a purpose, end. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Um, and, and, and this is what I mean about looking back and comparing what you write in the book and what actually happened to what's happening today. And when there's a purpose and it's, it's honorable and virtuous and is going to help the people in the colonies, you see a rationale. You see, it's, not, it's not arbitrary. It's not just, well, let's trash the place to trash the place. You also see um, how essential is the press. Um, I mean, there, it, it's not, it's not, I think, immaterial that you have an explosion of media at this point. And, and at one point, one of the, one of the British governors says, um, one of the royal governors says, you, how are you supposed to legislate in a town with five newspapers? Um, I mean, there really is this sense that because the papers are out there in the Boston Gazette, for which Adams writes in particular, are being read by people um, and by more people than anyone expected, um, you have, you're, you're beginning to obtain a kind of power that you wouldn't have otherwise. So it really is, I mean, a sort of a testimony to the press of those years and to the Massachusetts press in particular. That's absolutely true. I'm glad you mentioned royal governor um, because it's, I'm reminded that another one of Adams' causes was to make certain that they were paid for by the citizens of the colonies, and in this case, Massachusetts, as opposed to by Britain, who then would own them and there's no accountability. So that, those were among the, the many British missteps. One is to arrange for the governor to be paid directly from the crown, and the second is for the, ju for the judges to be paid directly by the crown. And it's that second one that will help Adams to begin to put the communities of correspondence together, because that one annoys everyone. The idea that justice is now in the hands of the crown, not in the hands of the people, um, is, is absolutely, you know, that's, that's just a no-fly zone. That's, a, that's absolutely objectionable across the board. Um, and Adams and, and a colleague of his will actually talk about, you know, barging into courtrooms and asking justices if they're going to be willing to accept their, I mean, he's very forthright about this. Are they going to be willing to accept um, payment from the crown, despite the fact that that obviously is rubbing everyone the wrong way? But it's what powers him, what allows him finally to get traction for the committees of correspondence. I wish he were with us today. Me too. Then he could answer some of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that sort of leadership and vision and principled voice, it's so important. You know, I, it's funny. I came to the book in part to answer one of your earlier questions after writing about Salem Witchcraft, which was a very dark five years yeah. of my life. Um, and... and only at the very end of that summer of 1692 does anyone finally have the courage to stand up and begin to say, something isn't right here. Why are we prosecuting these people? Could there really be this many witches in Massachusetts? And the first people who do that do it anonymously because it's a very dangerous thing to um, assert, to be skeptical in any way of the witchcraft mm. court. Um, you're always accused of witchcraft if you, if you actually voice any doubt. And one of those people was a, um, was a very wealthy Boston businessman named Thomas Brattle. And, and I felt as if there was some communion between Thomas Brattle, who actually publishes his objections to the witchcraft court anonymously because it is so dangerous, and Samuel Adams. There was something about the sort of starchy tenacity of the character and the willingness to take a very unpopular stand at great personal cost. Yes. Because, I mean, Adams, you know, really doesn't, his home life suffers tremendously um, for his political convictions. At one point, he's very, very modest, and at one point he will write his wife and say, um, you know, I have long understood that we have to 
give up the, the, sweetness, the sweetest things in life for the sake of our country. But then he catches himself because that seems like an immodest claim, and he sort of retracts it a little bit. But it's a very endearing letter where he, it's very clear that this is taking a real toll on him. Yes, and it was, and, and the family. It was indeed. Stacy, as a biographer, what is your relationship like with your subjects after you've written the book? Um, they become members of the family. I, th that's the answer I wanted. Yeah. There's, this, there's, this, there's this funny moment, I'm sure every biographer would say this, where um, you realize it's time to move out the previous tenant and move somebody new in. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a polite way of putting that. And there's, there's a poignancy to that moment where you're, you know, you've lived with this person for in my case, usually five or six years. I, was I can't. Say, this book was five years, was it not? This book was 25 years. <laughs> you know, remember what COVID was like? And this was my COVID book, exactly. Um, and, and, you, and you get to the point where you think, I've lived with this person long enough, and I don't have the mental space, emotional space, whatever, to continue our relationship. Someone new must move in. And they get sort of, the crates get moved out of your office, and somebody new takes their position, but there's always that, you know, there's like that, that connection in some way. You've spent this many years reading this person's, you know, reading this person's medicine cabinet. You hope always to, you know, remain close to them. Is it hard to stop? I find it's very hard. I, I find that I can't start a new book for quite a while. I'm still, I'm still engaged with him, and I will be, I think, for quite some time now. So I, I've never really started the book right away after finishing the previous book. Oh, that's book. very easily understood. I mean, there's, there's just still too much of a connection there, and you're still, I mean, you're still seeing things in the material that you didn't necessarily see when you wrote the book. Oh, I'm sure. I, I'm sorry to say that with my publisher in the room. Um, <laughs> but it has to be the can case. Can I do it, do you think? Um, yes, and I think you're still, you're just, especially when people start reading it and you start hearing what resonates and what doesn't resonate, you often suddenly look at something fresh. And that's perfectly understandable. It's one, it's one of the thrills of the, yeah. of the profession. Yeah. Are but, you contemplating? Retirement? No. Oh. <laughs> Stacy, you must never retire. Was. No, a, a, um, a new subject? No, for the very reason that I feel just okay. completely, Samuel and I are still, I think, in this one together. He's still in my office at the moment. So no, <laughs> no one else has moved in. I think every book has a certain, there's always a certain um, frustration with every book. There's something you couldn't figure out, or there's something, that, some document, some holy grail for every book. Um, with my Nabokov book, I had promised the publisher I was going to work from both Vera and Vladimir's correspondence with each other, but I didn't realize that her correspondence doesn't exist. So that, oops, little problem there. So there, there's always a sort of, you know, the, the one thing that you wish you had or the documents, even in the cases of, the, of great, you know, voluminous documentation, there's always something that you end up not finding. And that remains, I think, a, a certain frustration for years. Do you still think about finding it? Well, I think if, if Vera Nabokov's papers turned up now, it would be my worst nightmare. <laughs> but for years, it was my biggest dream, right? So yes. Um, I, th I think you still go back to them um, sometimes. Things change, papers open up, um, suddenly things become available. I'm, you know, maybe those pages of Samuel Adams' daughter will turn up somewhere. I think there's always a relationship somehow with the subject. Oh, there, there would have to be. And right. uh, of course, I continue to reflect upon your biography of Cleopatra. Um, I had some questions for her too. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, so little was actually known about her. I mean, considering her image at least, what she actually looked like. That, that was a book where I felt for most of the first years I worked on it as if I should apologize for what I was about to say when I said I'm working on a book about Cleopatra because it seemed like it was so preposterous. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't read it, I've read it twice. It's electrifying. As, and I have to tell you, I'm rereading Samuel Adams because it's so chock-a-block with content that I, I, I can't absorb it all in, in one fell swoop. That's why I can't leave it behind, obviously. Well, no, I, I do understand that. If you said that you could, I would have challenged you. I would have said, oh, come on, Stacy. I'm, I'm being harsh come, here. Come clean. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Do you want me to grab it? Oh, thank you. So we have audience questions. Oh, here's a good one. I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> Stacy, what would most surprise Samuel Adams about the United States if he were alive and, and could observe our politics mm. today? 
Wow. E-gads. Yeah. I, you know, I feel as if, remember that political parties did not exist in the 18th century. Um, so I, I feel as if the fact that we are as terribly divided as we are would be the obvious thing, it, just because the whole point of his life was for us all, was, was for was for 13 colonies to cohere and for people to actually feel united in their, in their thinking. I mean, all of those abuses and injuries that are discussed in the Declaration, those were commonly felt by everyone. Everyone was meant to be in this together, even though there were loyalists among, among the colonists, obviously. So I'm afraid that the, the obvious answer is my answer, that you know, our crazy partisanship is what would most shock him. Do you think he could heal and repair us? I hope we can be healed and repaired. Yeah. We have to be. Yeah. yeah. This has gone way too far. Oh, here's a great question. Who, if anyone, do you see as the Samuel Adams of today? <laughs> wow. I don't know that I have an answer to that one. Who's, who's the most stubborn, unrelenting, eloquent polemicist? The trouble is when you throw in eloquent. Um, then everybody goes out the window. Okay, so he doesn't, she doesn't have to be eloquent. I mean, is it, is it a sort of, I mean, I would guess that it would not be a politician, obviously, that it would be someone who's writing or someone who's broadcasting or someone who's tweeting. I mean, someone who, an intellectual or a public figure as opposed to a politician. But I don't have a name for that person. But please email me afterwards when you do. Yeah. We should all think about this. It's a very profound question. I mean, what's interesting is that ability to draw people together, yeah. um, which he clearly had both on the ground in Boston um, and in the press. I mean, do we have that anymore? Is that even a thing to, anymore? That's a good question. So that, I think that's where I'm stumbling with this one. No, oh, it's a very good question. I'm going to ask Maybe it's a, an entertainment figure. Who would it be? Tim Gunn. No, hardly. <laughs> no. Um. There we go. That's it. It's Dolly Parton. There we go. That was oh, the perfect Dolly Parton, answer. I like that. Dolly, are you up to the, char to the charge? Um, I was actually going to ask this question, but someone beat me to it. Was, <laughs> was Samuel Adams a artist, brewer? We but have an I, artist among us. I love that. What I wanted to ask, though, was how would Samuel Adams respond to the fact that he's most popularly known today as a beer? You know, it's, it's so funny. If you Google Sam Adam, Samuel Adams, you get a beer. And if you Google John Hancock, you get an insurance company. <laughs> so what does that tell us about American history? Um, he didn't drink, or he was very abstemious, is the word that was, was always used. Was very him. cool, polished, and abstemious, exactly, yeah. and according to John. So um, I like to think he'd be flattered. I think he would be somewhat thrown for a loop by the fact that that seems to be Paul Revere on the bottle. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm thrown for a loop by that. But um, I, I mean, I think it's the strangest tribute. The founder of, um, of the company, and this I think is quite lovely, um, named it that because he had, a, he had a fifth grade, I think, teacher, might have been 11th grade, fifth grade, I think, teacher who was obsessed with Samuel Adams and who had done an entire, who had really sold Samuel Adams to him. And so he, when he came to name the beer, that was what came to mind. Well, we like a so Samuel that's, Adams obsession. We do, and we yeah. like the power of a, you know, of, a, yeah. of a good middle school teacher. And Adams' father owned a malt house, did he not? Yes, so there's a connection. So you need connection. malt to make beer. Um, so there, there were connections there, certainly. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. In a way, you've answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Samuel Adams, Cleopatra, Vera Nabokov, all three seem very hard to know working through the historical record. What attracts you to these kinds of, of unknowable figures? Um... To some extent, there's, I think, the thrill of the underdocumented, right? These are people yeah. who are hiding. Sometimes they're hiding in plain sight. I mean, I felt like Samuel Adams was really hiding in plain sight. He's I front and totally center. agree. And how is it possible that we all recognize the name and we all know nothing, right? So, um, and I think that was largely true with Cleopatra, who, as we all know, was Elizabeth Taylor in disguise. So, <laughs> you know, there was this question of how, you know, how did the real person suddenly become 
Elizabeth Taylor, right? I mean, how, how did that happen, that our, everything we knew about this Egyptian sovereign was completely subsumed by a Hollywood star? Um, and actually, I, when I was writing that book, I never watched the movie because you I was afraid. You told me that. I know, I still never watched it. Um, it's actually quite a movie. Yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I'll watch it tonight. Um, so, so, so to some extent, I think that the biographer's added value comes in finding the person who has gone missing. And I think you're looking to write the book that isn't on the shelf, right? We don't yeah. necessarily need another, a new biography of Edith Wharton or George Washington if we've just had a good one. So I think to some extent I'm thinking, well, what is the piece that's missing here or what is the life where, we can, where you can ask different questions? And I think that's easier with a life where um, you're, you're having to resurrect someone out of nothingness or you're having to pull someone out of the shadows. Sometimes it's more comfortable than other times. I mean, Mrs. Nabokov very distinctly did not want to be known, and I always had this feeling that I was like pulling the cat out of the cage at the vet, you know, that just I was doing this against someone's will and I was being mauled in the process. Um, so I felt there was, a, there was a resistance on the subject's part. Um, I think Samuel was a little easier, but the same, that same feeling that he was more comfortable in the shadows. Yeah. And he's a very modest, recessive man in many ways. And I felt somehow like this was unfairly bringing him to the fore. Didn't have that problem with Cleopatra. Um, but I think that that's part of it, is that there's, there's an extra challenge. Um, I mean, biography is this sport that you play with your hands tied behind your back because you have to be true to the facts. You can't add anything. And I think it's, you know, it's a little bit more edgy and interesting when, you, when it's someone who, who, who's very little known. I, I agree with you. And I also, I, I just admire so your ability to conduct this research and sift through all of this material so hugely successfully. And that leads to this question. Do you have a preferred method for organizing your research? Binder, Excel doc, et cetera. The answer to that question is so wildly embarrassing I almost can't even deliver it. No is the short answer. <laughs> um, and I still do this weird thing where I um, print documents and I put them in files and I mark them up. So I'm very paper intensive. Um, and I tend to organize things by subject and by chronology. Um, but I have them often in paper files and I think that's partly because I like to write in the margins of things and I, won't, and I won't remember my marginal thoughts if I have them only in a computer file. And partly just because I'm a dinosaur and that's how I learned to do it and it worked the first time so I just keep doing it. But I'm, paper is different, it just paper, is. Paper is different, it's, it, the, the, the biographer's cross to bear is the material, is the documentation. I mean that was especially true with the Ben Franklin book where you just have, I mean the, I, I wrote about eight years of Franklin's life for which we have two and a half times as much material as we have for the entire rest of his life. So it just, I was swimming in documentation. Um, but the only way I could really master it somehow was by printing things and putting them in files and organizing things both chronologically and by subject. So for Samuel Adams, there might be an, a file on his health or there might be a file on his on religion, or there might be a personal file. The personal file was very slim. Um, or there might be a file on the Stamp Act. And mm. then also there'll be a file, um, there'll be a chronology of some kinds. And the chronology is really interesting because that's when you see things, and we all do this with our lives, you see things that, the things that slalom across each other's wake. You see, you see cross currents that you wouldn't normally understand and you suddenly realize that you know, something happened simultaneous with something else yes. where there is cause and effect. And if you didn't, I think, organize the material chronologically, you would never... You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it. Yeah. It would be invisible. No, I totally agree. Speaking of, of Benjamin Franklin, I understand that your book's being made into a miniseries? It is. Um, it is. It's kind of great. It's, um, thank you. That's so nice. It's, um, it's an Apple series, um, and it, I don't think it has a title, and Benjamin Franklin is being played by Michael Douglas. Oh, good heavens. Yeah. Who well, does an amazing Benjamin Franklin. That's... Fantastic. Have uh, you met? I have, yeah. Oh, it's thrilling. It's set in the summer. Yeah, it's kind of sumptuous. I mean, it's a lot of, like, cleavage. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the French court. It's the 18th century. Well, There's a true. lot of cleavage. It's kind of wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a left field question. I thought that was a left field question. No, gonna, not compared to this go, one. You're going to go farther left than Michael Douglas and cleavage? <laughs> How physically athletic was Samuel Adams? <laughs> Oh, is there, is there like a Samuel Adams lacrosse league or something? <laughs> um, 
you know, Samuel Adams, we know, is of sort of middling stature. He's barrel-chested. He's probably about 5'8". Oh, um, he is? He, okay. he stands, we know from John Adams that when Samuel Adams declaimed, which he did fairly irregularly, he held himself very tall and on, sort of on his tippy toes and, and had a very um, sort of a, a, a very imposing posture. Um, I don't know anything about his sporting activities <laughs> at, whatsoever. Um, my guess is he, had a, and I should have mentioned, he had a tremor from a fairly young age. Oh, I didn't um, know it was, it was from a young age. From a fairly young age. And okay. it's described in an almost kind of religious-like way. I mean, I think it, it added to his, it added to the seriousness with which he was approached because hmm. he had this almost, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, almost a mystical tint to it because his hand and sometimes his head shook. Hmm. Um, and it seemed to be exacerbated by stress. Um, and it may have impeded his athletic career. It probably did. All right, in his recent book, The Cause, Joseph Ellis gives thanks to you for sharing your ideas with him and for suggesting his book's subtitle. Did Mr. Ellis have any ideas or suggestions for you with this book? I don't know who asked that question, but it's really lovely because it gives me a chance to say this book had a fairy godfather who was Joseph J. Ellis. Aww. That's really lovely. Um, Joe was, was, the great, was a great champion of this book from the start and basically sort of hit himself in the head and said, why didn't I think of that? So that was lovely. And he's been really helpful all the way through. He's a brilliant writer. Um, mm -hmm. But every once in a while when I had a kind of a wacky idea, um, he was the perfect sounding board when I would say, do you think I'm out on a limb here when I say, you know, this about Samuel Adams as master propagandist, and he would say, no, you're, you know, here, here are the 12 reasons why that works or doesn't work. Excellent. Now, this goes back to an earlier question in a, in a manner of speaking. Is it true that you write longhand? Someone's been Googling. Um, <laughs> that is another embarrassing and true fact. Um, and it is, and I do, I think, for the following reason, um, I'm a really good typist. It's one of the things I do really well. Um, the few things. And so I type very quickly, but I don't think as quickly as I type. So something about the that very fact that I'm actually forcing myself to write longhand, which as you may all have realized lately is really hard now that we don't do it very often. It's a more arduous way of putting the words on the page. It slows me down. And it does seem to um, result in a slimmer, if not a smarter book. I find that I write longer on a keyboard. I don't know if oh, everyone else has noticed this, but huh. it's just so easy. So you sort of just kind of keep waxing on and, and you may be repeating yourself, whereas it's so really actually resistant to you know, put that pencil to the legal pad, in my case, um, that I feel as if it's, I don't know, there's something about the actual physical contact of led with paper that I feel is just inherent to the thinking that goes on. Well, I appreciate I, I'm a dinosaur. I mean, I'm just going to well, say that again. Well, you're talking to another one. Um, <laughs> but I, I appreciate the fact that it slows you down. And because I, I, I understand not thinking as quickly as one can type. Right. And it can right. be frustrating and, and perhaps one advance the plot. I just feel like I go off on it. I'll, I'll very easily go off on a tangent if I'm typing and wouldn't take the trouble to do that if I were actually, you know, you have to yeah. actually push that pencil across the page. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one last question. St oh, we, well, you asked that. Or you answered that, sorry. Oh, here it is. This is a good last question. If you could ask Samuel Adams one question, what would it be? Just one. Oh, okay. okay, so I'm going to put aside the independence question because we've talked about that. I would probably ask about the Tea Party. Um, this is clearly something that he jointly orchestrates. Um, he's clearly very much on top of this. Um, John Adams will talk about what a sublime and majestic moment it was. It's Samuel and his glory. Um, it's clearly something that's cooked up behind the scenes. Um, he knows who those people are. Everyone in Boston knows who those people are. Nobody says a word, but who actually came up with the idea? Um, Thomas Hutchinson very quickly afterward realizes that this whole thing had been preconcerted. Who came up with the idea? Who said, we're going to do this actually really daring thing and destroy you know, private property? Um, the punishment is very swift and very draconian. They must have guessed that that was going to happen. Was it Samuel who was the driving force behind it? That would be a very good question. Absolutely. Stacy. I want to thank you. Tim, you always best. enlighten us. You always t take us to a, a much greater place. And you make our lives better. 
You are the best. No, thank really, you very thank much. you. Thank you all for coming. Thank Stacey you. Stacy Schiff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Tim.